Hello and welcome back to the channel. Today we're taking a look at a Mead Starfinder 16 inch f4.5 Dobsonian reflector from the late 1990s through the early 2000s. If you've just stumbled across this channel, you may be wondering why I'm sitting here with a giant paper towel looking thing in my driveway, but this is a serious astronomical telescope designed for looking up at the night sky. So it moves slowly, gathering light 16 inches worth with this primary mirror here. There's a secondary mirror that diverts light out into this eyepiece, and that's where you look. And you can see I have a step ladder here, and the reason it's there is because when this thing gets looking up very high, you're going to have to get on a ladder to go look through the eyepiece. So I've said many times before, I think the Mead reflectors from the late 1970s to the early 1980s, which is not this series by the way, are some of the best telescopes ever made, certainly among the most beautiful and well made. Unfortunately, sometime in the 1990s, they decided to discontinue that series and they came out with this Starfinder series. This is one of my least favorite Mead telescope lines of all time. They went from first to worst, I don't understand it. Gone were the metal and cast iron and fiberglass and aluminum construction. And it was obvious they tried to get the cost down as much as possible. These are cheap and these are cheaply made. The metal and fiberglass construction has been replaced by sonotube, fancy name for cardboard, and melamine covered particle board. It doesn't hold up very well. Six inch, eight inch, 10 inch, 12 and a half inch and 16 inch models in Dobsonian and equatorial versions. I believe the only aperture that did not have an equatorial version was the 12 and a half inch. All of the others were available both ways. So again, not very desirable telescopes, but if you had to pick one that might be kind of collectible and desirable, it would be this one, the 16 inch. I think largely because it is so unwieldy and so unreasonable. These are absurd telescopes. They are unreasonably awful. Everybody knows they're awful. That does not stop people, well-meaning people who are ambitious and looking to take this telescope and upgrade it and change the mechanics and make it into something useful. The reason they want to do that is because the mirrors in these things were actually pretty good. I've never seen one of these mirrors on these that were bad. Most of them have been really nice. It's everything around the mirror that's just awful. And so the reasoning usually goes something like, you know what, there's a beautiful thing inside here and I'm going to bring it out, you know. I'm going to change her. She's going to be beautiful when I'm done with her. She's Audrey Hepburn and I'm Rex Harrison. And you know, I have seen some really beautiful restoration projects based upon these mirrors, but I think in most cases, you see a person get one of these and then they don't realize how big a project is and they abandon it halfway through. As a result, you see a lot of these out there that are in a state of half restoration and the person just decides they can't deal with this anymore and they just want to get rid of it. So as a result of that, you will often see these things for sale at very reasonable prices. And in fact, I've even seen a couple of these take place at a transaction value of zero. That's right, people have actually given these things away. Usually what happens is a significant other says, look, that thing's been in the garage for 10, 15, 20 years, get it out of here. I don't care how you do it, just I want it gone. So I'm not saying you're gonna get yours for free, but I have seen it happen. Okay, so like all Dobsonian telescopes, it's in two pieces. The optical tube weighing around 100 pounds and the rocker base weighing around 70 pounds. So some of you may be saying, well, 100 pounds, I can lift that. Well, that may be the case, but these optical tubes are very cumbersome and unwieldy. All of the weight is in the back and there's nothing for you to grab onto. So subjectively, it carries a lot bigger than 100 pounds. Early versions had an inch and a quarter focuser and this five by 24 finder. So look at this, the finder is ridiculous. It's like a pea shooter on a cannon and the inch and a quarter eyepiece is just not adequate. You really do need a two inch focuser on this thing because you wanna be able to see the maximum amount of sky without having to refocus. Later versions did substitute an eight by 50 finder and a two inch focuser. Unfortunately, that two inch focuser is the, I believe it's called the number 77, is one of the worst pieces of astronomy equipment ever made. It's made of cheap, thin plastic, rack the focuser out too much and the thing just breaks on you. They were just awful. 
So if you do get one of these with one of these two stock focusers on there, count on replacing them. Okay, so let's say you find yourself with one of these, you found a good deal on one, you get it home. And by the way, if you get one that's in stock condition, that's never been modified, that's a dead giveaway. The owner never looked through it. So where do you start? Well, the one thing you must do when you get one of these is you have to fix the azimuth bearing. This is the motion that goes left and right like this. This one has been modified a little bit and it's better than the stock version, but it's still not great. Normally on a Dobsonian, this version, the altitude is not your problem. That's not too bad. It's this one here. It just gets really sticky and herky-jerky and it's just really tough to move. You can see the owner here has taken some remedial measures. The ground board, which should be white, you can see it's a wooden color there. That's actually a wooden tabletop that they found at a big box home improvement store. So the two materials you need are Teflon and flooring laminate. That's right, the Formica on your floor actually winds up being a really great telescope material. And the dissimilar properties of the Teflon and the Formica wind up being very good for this sort of stiction that you need for a telescope. So when you get under there, the Teflon pads, I can almost guarantee you, are going to be too small. You're going to have to put bigger ones underneath. So I'll also warn you, when you get under there, the Teflon pads may not actually be Teflon. They may be pieces of white plastic. I've seen that done a lot. It makes you think that there's Teflon under there. So that's been done on this one, but the flooring laminate has not been put on the other side, so it's sort of halfway done. So you've got Teflon riding on this melamine material here. I mean, it's better than the stock, but you know, for precise motions, tracking things across the sky, it's really not very good. And in fact, when I was using this thing, if I had to look at something higher than about this up in the sky, higher than about 45 degrees in the sky, I just wouldn't look at it because number one, I'm gonna be on the ladder, and number two, I'm gonna be put, doing really precise motions back and forth here. It's just not fun. So on the altitude bearings, same thing. It's not as bad, although it's still not great. So first thing, if you're gonna modify this, a common statistic that you'll often hear is the diameter of this bearing should be about the diameter of the primary mirror. So in this case, it should be about 16 inches, this thing, but it's not. It's something like five or six inches. It is way too small. Look at premium Dobsonian manufacturers like Obsession, and you'll see that their side bearings are as much as one and a half times the diameter of the primary mirror, to the point where they don't actually make the full circle, they cut them in half. So, okay, well, that's gonna to be tough to modify. Let's say we have to live with this. That's all right. What you can do, same thing, get some Teflon material and put them underneath here. The owner has done this, although it's not quite right. They put these pads in the middle. These are furniture sliders. They should have been put out towards the edges here and here. Also, this surface has not been treated. Flooring laminate works there as well. Another tip that Rick Singmaster used to do for Starmaster telescopes, get industrial strength Velcro, the rough side, and put it on here. Yes, that actually works. Industrial strength Velcro and Teflon results in a very good altitude bearing material. Okay, so let's say you fix the bearings and the motions are smooth or smoother than they used to be. You're not done. This telescope is front heavy. That is not unusual. Many commercial Dobsonians are front heavy. You put an eyepiece in here and this thing will just slowly drift down by itself. To combat this, you may see that the owner has put a piece of Velcro on the back here. And I've actually put the mating piece of Velcro on a four pound counterweight off of one of my equatorial mounts. And you could just kind of pick this up and slide it around based on where this needs to be based on you know how much weight is on the front of the tube. So that's gonna have to be done. Another thing, is when you do get this thing to the point where you can use it. The secondary veins here, these veins are really thin and they vibrate. They actually sing when you're moving the telescope or when you're touching it at all. So you can think, well, why don't you just wait till it settles down? It's just you know something I'll have to do every time I use the scope. Uh, no, because even the act of using the focuser, racking the focuser in and out, will be enough to make this thing sing to the point where this view is gonna be vibrating so much, you can't even focus on it. So this is gonna to have to be modified somehow. And what I used to do is I would take little strips of wood 
and just sort of, you know, take masking tape and put it on here just to dampen the vibrations. And so you do this on two or three of these and that will help also. I'll also point out, if you're on the ladder, so, you know, if you're on the ladder with like this and you're looking through the eyepiece, so this doesn't look too bad, okay? But, you know, we're outside, we can see in the dark, this can be precarious because you're constantly moving the telescope, you're tracking it across the sky, you may be pushing the scope away from you and it could create a safety issue. Since you can't move the eyepiece at, at that angle, it's fixed, you have to be looking through the finder, you're gonna be leaning over there, you're gonna be sometimes straddling the tube like Ahab and the whale, and it's leading some people to refer to this model as the Widowmaker. If you don't feel like tackling this project, there have been people in the past that have built kits specifically around this mirror set. Astro Systems used to make them. In fact, they may still be around. You can look them up. And I had mine done by a company called Night Sky. Jim was a guy who built beautiful structures. I don't think he's in business anymore either. But if you look around in your local astronomy club and amateur telescope makers, there may be somebody who's be willing to do this for you. So I had one. The mirror came out of one of these that had been left in somebody's basement. And the basement flooded. You can imagine what water will do to sauna tube and particle board. It was like the Wicked Witch of the West. It melted. The only thing that was left was the mirror sitting in the puddle, and the guy sold it to me for a very attractive price. Anyway, I had mine done by night sky. I was very happy with that telescope for a long time and probably shouldn't have sold it. Some people are asking, do you need a paracore if you have this? I would say it's borderline. I had one at the time. I thought it was good, but it's not strictly necessary. Again, you're talking about a pretty cheap scope here, and those paracores cost about $500. Your choice on that one. Okay, so I thought we'd come inside and talk a little bit more about this. I do want to stress the obvious thing here. This is a big cumbersome, awkward telescope. And what I find is when people have aperture fever, it can be very difficult to talk them out of buying such a telescope. And they'll say, yeah, 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 I'm, I'm aware of that, but you know, I'll, I'll work through it somehow. I find in most cases with most people, after a short honeymoon period, it just never gets used again. So you do wanna be aware of that. I'm not stopping you from buying one of these, and I don't think I can stop you if this is what you want. So when we pick this thing up, I mean, it took three of us to get this in the pickup truck. And when we did, the guy said to me, just before we left, he said, are you sure you wanna do this? And I have to admit, I even thought about it for a second myself and I said, yeah, okay, let, yeah, let's go ahead and do it. So another thing is a reader wrote me once and that business I talked about with strengthening the spider veins with little strips of wood. Somebody wrote me and said, no, 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 you're working too hard. Don't try to find those strips of woods. Chopsticks. He said he takes a pair of chopsticks and then he tapes them with masking tape to the spider veins. And he said, if you do it right, you only have to do maybe one or two of them and the other two, or the other three will stop vibrating. Oh yeah, look at that. High tech solutions to modern problems. So as far as observing goes, I think that every person watching this should view the moon once through a really big reflector. And it'll blow out your night vision for like the next half hour. You're not gonna be good for anything for a while, but it's terrific. You really should experience that. So I've had this thing out a few times now, and here's what I found. For the first 15 minutes or so, it's fine. In fact, the first time or two I had this out, it has been several years since I had used one of these things, and it was actually quite pleasant. I mean, big aperture, not a lot of money, and I'm starting to question myself, like maybe I'm too hard on this thing. But after 15 or 20 minutes, it did start to get a little awkward. Pointing at anything at the zenith, just forget about it because you wind up moving a lot in azimuth as opposed to in altitude. It just really doesn't want to move in azimuth. It gets very frustrating. I just stop looking at things that are high up in the sky. Showpiece objects look terrific. M42, I mean, things are bright. That's, I should be stating the obvious here, but things are really, really bright. Green color, easily seen, four stars in the trapezium. Was it sharp? 
you know, there's some flexure somewhere in the system. The collimation would change a little bit depending on what side of the sky I was on. It wasn't super sharp, but that's not why you're buying one of these things. You're buying it because it's a light bucket. It's big, it's bright, and you want to see things really as bright as possible. Yeah, so I look at a lot of clusters, you know, the M35 through M38. I looked at the center of the Rosette Nebula, NGC 2244, mostly showpiece objects. You know, I didn't really try to find obscure objects because you would have to fine tune a lot with the motions. And I just didn't feel like dealing with that. So if you're handy and you don't mind taking on a project of this magnitude and you think you can handle it, don't let me stop you. There's lots of great resources on the web, too many to list here, but I will point out some of the classic texts in our hobby. One of them, this is an older book, Build Your Own Telescope by Richard Berry. As you can see, lots of dog ears on here. This is a much referenced book in my collection. And Berry and Dave Kriege, The Dobsonian Telescope. So both of these books are through Wilman Bell. That's our publisher. They cater to astronomy enthusiasts. As of filming right now, Wilman Bell is, seems to be going through some change of ownership or some instability. I'm really hoping that's cleared up by the time you see this. I don't know about you. I could always use some more good books. And finally, I did review this telescope for scope reviews back in 2002. I'll leave a link in the description below. So there you have it. A look at the Mead 16 inch F4.5 Dobsonian reflector telescope. One of my least favorite lines that Mead ever came out with. If I haven't given you enough reasons not to buy one of these, contact me, maybe I'll think of some more. And yet, you know something? I find that there's an odd charm about this particular model. And if I had to pick one of that Starfinder line, this is the one I'd get, and partially because I know the mirrors are good and there's a good telescope in here waiting to get out. And again, just want to sort of find an odd sort of charm on this model. I'll also point out that they did sell for quite some time an equatorial version of this, an even more ridiculous and absurd telescope because the weight of the optical tube is even higher up on the air, and they sold for quite a bit more money. These were around $1,200 plus freight and some packing material. The equatorial version sold for $2,495, $2,695, and yet, you know what? It's the same thing. I kind of want one of those, and I can't really explain why. I think I just display it in the house so when people come in, they'll say, wow, what in the world is that thing? But at close to $3,000, I'm not sure that's a cost-effective way to put a decoration into my house. So thanks for watching, and I'll see you soon.